Welcome everybody to today's session called The Silent Pandemic, the human and environmental costs of pesticide production and use. My name is Sasha Gabizon. I'm the International Director of Women Engaged for a Common Future for an international network of ecofeminist organizations. And I've been asked to facilitate the session today, which is a great honor. Um, let me introduce to you our first panelist, who I will be giving the floor to um, soon, who is with us here in the room, Saroyeni Rengam of Pesticide Action Network Asia Pacific. Welcome, Saroyeni. It's wonderful to have you here all the way from Malaysia, I believe. Yes, thank you, Sasha. Great. Let me also welcome our second panelist, Javier Souza of Pesticide Action Network Latin America. Welcome, Javier. Buenos dias, Javier, um, coming all the way from Latin America. Javier, you are muted, but that's okay. So we will have um, a session of one and a half hours. We will start with um, a presentation by Saro Yeni Rengam. She will give us a PowerPoint presentation. We'll have a discussion with you, the participants. You can ask your questions in English or Spanish or French in the chat or in the questions and answer box. Um, then we will move to Javier Souza. And um, Javier will speak in Spanish and there will be a translation for him. He will also have a PowerPoint presentation and we'll again have a round of questions and answers um, from your side. So we'll try to make this a really interactive session. Um, yeah, I'm really looking forward to today's session and I'm going to ask right away Saro Yeni to give her presentation. Sarin, the floor is yours. Thank you, Sasha. Okay, I'll start sharing my PowerPoint. Okay, great. Um, it's a pleasure to be here in this uh, conference and uh, be part of uh, discussions on uh, many issues around food and agriculture production, but we are focusing on the uh, human and environmental costs of pesticides production and use, and we call it the silent uh, pandemic. Uh, I'll be focusing a lot on uh, the work that we have been doing in, in uh, Asia Pacific and uh, Javier will, will be looking at uh, the issues uh, emerging in, in from Latin America. And you will see the whole in terms of the global um, uh, issues uh, and, and problems um, and concerns in terms of uh, pesticides. Overall, uh, if you look at the uh, global pesticide use and production, uh, the global pesticide market has doubled in the last 20 years with sales of about US 60 billion in 2020. And, uh, and there's more um, expansion uh, that we are seeing in the pesticide uh, markets. About 2 million tons of pesticides are utili utilized annually worldwide. And by the year 2020, this, uh, this estimates that it has increased to 3.5 million tons uh, in, in the use. And a lot of it is being used in China, followed by the US and Argentina has just um, increased tremendously in the last five years, uh, almost by 40%. It's, it's amazing. I mean, it's crazy. But um, we are seeing even, uh, you know, uh, use increasing by 11% in countries like Vietnam and uh, um, in India the use is actually increasing uh, tremendously. Most are herbicides, 50%, followed by insecticides, fungicide, 18%, and other types such as rodenticides and nematicides. And according to UNICEF 2018, demand is increasing in many developing countries 
which together account for a quarter of global pesticide use. And this is a, a you know, kind of um, map uh, that FAO pro, uh, produced that shows the, the countries where uh, a lot of pesticides are, are being used. And you see that uh, Asia and Latin America had followed by uh, Africa. Although uh, what's missing is Europe is also having tremendous use uh, increase in terms of uh, pesticides as well. What are the impacts on human health and the environment? Um, a study that was uh, released in 2020, at the end of 2020, scientists from Pan-Asia Pacific, Pan-Germany, Pan-North America estimated that 385 million cases of unintentional acute pesticide poisonings occur each year and mainly occupational, and they estimate about 11,000 deaths, but we feel that it was really a tip of the iceberg and that there are many other deaths that, uh, that are not being uh, reported. And there's been huge increase. Uh, if you look at the WHO figures in 1990, they said 25 million cases. And now um, we are seeing a, a huge increase, 385 million cases. Um, and 57 or percent of the studies were self-reported to field uh, researchers. And the, the study is there uh, in case you want to uh, Google it. And here just some figures from the study itself where yearly incidence of non-fatal occupational acute pesticide poisoning. Uh, I just identified some of the countries in, for example, you find Cambodia, very small country, 62,000 uh, yearly reports of incidents of non-fatal occupational acute pesticide poisoning. Oh, sorry. And then you have uh, Laos, which is uh, even a smaller country, and a lot of it is uh, rural communities, um, very uh, you know uh, small infrastructure, but 39,000. Uh, were affected uh, with this. Uh, and you can see that Pakistan is quite high, India is very high in terms of yearly incidents. And these are all reports um, that uh, were picked up and there may be others uh, because as you know, developing countries, um, the, the kind of uh, reporting is not very well developed. And so, um, so this, uh, we feel, that just a tip of the iceberg. And then the worst part is uh, the long-term health impacts of pesticide use. And here it's much more difficult, but there are links between some of these um, chronic effects and the pesticides that we are all using uh, in food and agriculture production. So birth defects, uh, cancers, asthma, allergies, reproductive disorders, uh, obesity, diabetes, and neuro, neuro uh, developmental and behavioral disorders. So you can see that uh, the chronic effects are happening, but there's less documentation, there's less uh, studies, but although some of that is still emerging, and uh, for example, glyphosate has been uh, identified as um, a human a potential uh, sorry, probable human carcinogen. And uh, this was done by IAC, the International Agency for Research on Cancers. So it, it's, it's uh, emerging and, and this has many um, pesticides where there's a lot of concerns about its long-term uh, impacts. We also see the environmental impacts of pesticides and this is quite, um, Quite also, it's also quite uh, of a big concern to all of us because uh, we see dec declining bee populations. And uh, you know there were studies in 2012, um, 2013, where one treated corn seed uh, is uh, seen to have enough neonicotinoids to kill 80,000 honeybees. So, um, and there has been a lot of uh, um, advances in terms of Europe trying to, uh, well, certain countries in Europe uh, banning these neonicotinoids and uh, slowly the, the 
population of honeybees is also uh, slowly increasing. And we see that in Italy and some other countries in Europe. Bird populations have uh, declined also 20 to 25% and pesticides has been um, indicated as one of the uh, causation, uh, the, the causes of uh, bird populations declining. Loss of biodiversity, 75% loss of flying insects. Uh, although they said that it's um, possible that pesticides could be uh, the uh, cause for this uh, drop in uh, loss of flying insects. And then the widespread contamination and loss of aquatic life, uh, widespread contamination and loss of soil biodiversity because of uh, pesticide use, but also fertilizer use. And uh, the leaching of the, um, the, the uh, pesticides and the fertilizers, you know, going into the aquatic uh, um, uh, systems and affecting aquatic life. So all this is leading to, leading to ecosystem disruption and loss of ecosystem services, which are tremendous. Uh, if you know that, uh, well, since you, uh, many of you are in this uh, area of, um, in terms of food and agriculture, farmers and um, academicians, we know that bee populations are very important for uh, pollination. And therefore the loss of bee population will affect, you know, 40% of our uh, food production, especially uh, vegetables and other, besides, you know, honey, sorry. Um, then this is the kind of uh, use of pesticides that you will see in Asia. They spring pesticides, people are walking around, uh, children are running, um, you know, so there is a lot of uh, exposure in the rural areas and um, even around schools uh, where children are, are, are studying. And uh, we have found that in our study of rights and poison uh, that was uh, produced in 2018, uh, that in Asia, seven out of 10 farmers suffer from acute pesticide poisoning. Again, this is self-reporting uh, reported and uh, blindness among the, um, we found cases of blindness among the mango orchard uh, workers and their children in Andhra Pradesh. And you can see that um, this seven out of 10 farmers suffering from acute pesticide poisoning is also being reflected by uh, FAO studies in the uh, Mekong areas, Mekong countries. And uh, so this is something that uh, we are seeing uh, in terms of farmers using pesticides or even children exposed to pesticides when they are uh, in the schools or when they are, you know, a child, uh, as children, they are also laborers, some of them, uh, due to poverty. This is something we found which was so shocking. Paraquat, which is one of the most dangerous pesticide, a weedicide that is sold um, in, in, in polythene bags. It, one teaspoon actually can kill you, uh, if, you uh, if you accidentally uh, consume it or you are exposed to it, uh, there are cuts and you, know, and, and you have uh, exposure and it gets onto your skin, you get really poisoned. And paraquat, there's no antidote. And so it's one of the most dangerous pesticides. And you'll find that it's still being used, even though it's banned in uh, Switzerland, where uh, the producer Syngenta is, uh, is headquartered. And uh, also in, in Europe, it has been, EU, it has been banned for many years now, um, but it's being still produced and sold in, uh, developing countries in Asia. And most of the time, what we see is that uh, the majority of farmers do not use personal protective equipment and 80% have direct contact with pesticides. So you can see that they are just, you know, um, uh, decanting and they are what you call mixing uh, the pesticides without any kind of protecting protective clothing and it's highly concentrated pesticides. And uh, this is normal when you see uh, farmers spraying pesticides without any kind of uh, protective clothing, but also um, no shoes, uh, you know, they go barefoot, sometimes shoe, uh, slippers, and uh, they just have a handkerchief around their uh, face or sometimes, you know, um, 
Some workers in the Philippines used bra caps because they couldn't find anything else. They cut that and used that uh, to protect themselves. So these are some of the realities on the ground uh, in Asia. And, and we see this also in, in other countries uh, in, in Africa and Latin America. And this is what happens to uh, you know, pesticide uh, packaging. It just gets thrown into the waterways, the farms, the soil, and contaminates everything, uh, the water and, you know, um, and uh, other uh, aspects, soil, um, it leaches into the uh, waterways as well, rivers and streams. This is really um, unbelievable because uh, pesticide uh, packaging was used to um, uh, repackage uh, children's cakes. Uh, and this was pesticide packets, you know, where children's cakes were packed. And uh, it, we found this in Cambodia and some of the uh, children fell ill and uh, it was finally banned. But it's something that uh, all, you know, kind of happens because people find that the packaging, the, the containers are reused uh, to carry water, to carry um, you know, other uh, materials and in Cambodia in uh, used for cakes. Uh, this was also where we found that a lot of uh, pesticides were being sprayed over uh, around the vicinity of schools and uh, basically exposing children uh, to pesticides. And you have glyphosate, you have 2,4-D, you have uh, all the, um, uh, you know, permethrin, uh, uh, cypermethrin, you know, all the kind of pesticides that have long uh, term uh, impacts, uh, as well as acute uh, toxicity. So uh, we did a study, uh, this was in 2018, 2019, where we found that um, 24 children were surveyed, uh, and they were basically uh, exposed um, many of them were, were actually uh, floriculture. Uh, they, they picked the, um, they were involved in floriculture and they picked the uh, flowers. Uh, these are child laborers in India and uh, this happened in Tamil Nadu and Andhra Pradesh and, uh, uh, and, and you know, the uh, flowers are, are sprayed and the children go in to do the uh, plucking of the, of the, uh, flowers. A lot of it is jasmine, but other flowers as well were, were invo uh, involved. And these were the kind of pesticides that were sprayed, uh, cypermethrin, lambda, lambda cyclohatrin, monocrotophers, another highly hazardous pesticide, clopyrifos, which causes brain uh, impacts on the developing brains of uh, children. Paraquat, again, as I mentioned, one of the most hazardous pesticide. Then we found that um, a UNICEF uh, study that shows 108 million children are engaged in agricultural work globally, and children regularly work in the fields during or following the spring season when levels of pesticide residues are high. Four to, time, four to five times the amount of toxins from a given source is absorbed by children compared to uh, adults. This is a WHO study. And in 2016, the Special Rapporteur on Toxic, Pasco Tunchak, issued a report describing the silent pandemic of disability and disease associated with childhood exposures to toxics and pollution and explaining the obligations of states and the responsibilities of business enterprises to protect against such exposure. So this was uh, done by the special reporter and, and we found that the silent pandemic is what we are all facing uh, in Asia. We, we know that children are being exposed. Uh, there, there are some uh, studies that are being done by researchers that showed the IQ of children have dropped uh, comparing them to the rural and urban uh, populations because of the uh, and they suspect heavily that these are children in areas where a lot of pesticides are being used. And you can see the impact on the children. Who are our future? How future 
and therefore um, we should be in fact protecting this, uh, these children. These are some of the pesticides recently we found. Uh, you will find carbofuran, highly toxic to bees, but it's WHO1B. Paraquat, which is, I don't know, WHO cl uh, classifies it as WH, sorry, class two, which is crazy because it's such a highly hazardous pesticide without antidote. So, um, but paraquat is there, easily available, clopyrifos, as I mentioned, and many other uh, pesticides. A lot of it, you can see that under the uh, listing, it's highly toxic to bees. So I don't know what, uh, you know, whether any studies are being done in Asia, but we are finding that the bee population uh, is uh, being affected, but there's no real um, studies that are coming out. So we're using a lot of studies done in the US and Europe in terms of uh, the impact on bee populations. These are some of the uh, pesticides that are being used. Uh, in Asia, and you find that a lot of it is uh, banned in many countries. Uh, here, 28, it's just that uh, we just wanted to show that EU uh, does not allow these uh, pesticides. Um, and so, you know, uh, it's not approved. And these are some of the uh, pesticides that are being used. Um, this was done last year in uh, October, August, September, October last year. And you can see that, again, all these highly hazardous pesticides are being used, even paraquat. Um, and you, you find actually it's banned in some countries, but you can still fi find it in the, in the fields being used. And then there's this double standard uh, where um, our friends from Pan Germany have found that as of 2017, Germany exported nine pesticides which are not approved for use in the EU, including the pesticides cyanamide, acetochlor, teproloxidim, which are listed by the EU as carcinogenic and toxic to reproduction. It also exported 59,616 tons of pesticide ingredients, including inert uh, gases. And so you find that a lot of this being dumped uh, or being uh, sent to developing countries which have so much less uh, controls, regulations, and farmers are not aware and um, they even use uh, it, they call it medicine instead of uh, you know, poisons. And so the, 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 the whole uh, use is, uh, uh, and exposure is you know, tremendous. Uh, if you look at what's happening with all these banned pesticides coming to our countries. Another study by Public Eye, uh, a Swiss NGO, uh, also found estimates that um, 51 of the 122 pesticide active ingredients in Syngenta's portfolio are not authorized for use in its home country, Switzerland. So there's this double standards. And who are the, uh, who profits? So you find that the same com uh, companies that produce pesticides, 70%, 70 percent of the market um, uh, is you know, controlled by top four, four companies, that is Bayer, BSF, Syngenta, and Kutiva. And a lot of it has, uh, you know, all these, some of the um, companies have bought each other over or they have merged. Um, and the same companies are also involved in the seeds, commercial seeds market, 67%, still controlled by top four of the pesticides. And so this, you can see that the consolidation of uh, the market uh, shares uh, in the food and agriculture sector is, is becoming smaller and smaller as they merge and they buy over and they you know, consolidate uh, the power and, and control. So all this, uh, you know, showing a very kind of uh, very dim picture of the situation. But we have, uh, I'm happy to say that agroecology uh, is still um, 
surviving and it's expanding uh, all throughout Asia. Many uh, communities are now uh, understanding the impacts of pesticides. Um, they see their, their neighbors, their, their, their own communities being affected by these pesticides and they're looking for viable uh, solutions. And so uh, agroecology, uh, is seen as a viable pro-people, pro-planet alternative where um, it's, uh, it's seen to be uh, beneficial, uh, even in the context of agrarian reform and long-term rural development. It can thrive when there's substantial and reliable state support for production and extension services. And in Laos, the, the government actually has been helping uh, small uh, food producers to set up small uh, markets where they can sell their products, especially if they are close to the uh, big cities or big towns. And so um, they can market that in, in the domestic market. And it's easily uh, absorbed because there's a lot more, um, uh, uh, what do you call, uh, demand, but uh, the, the production is not keeping up. So there's a lot of uh, possibilities as the uh, domestic market can actually ex absorb agroecological products. And as I mentioned, thousands of small food producers in Asia are slowly moving towards uh, food and fiber uh, through agroecology. So what are our recommendations? And I just wanted to share this because we felt that um, you know it's, it's important to face out the highly high highly hazardous pesticides and replace them with agroecology. We want to support children's rights to a safe environment, also by promoting agroecology, stop the pesticide industry to continue to pollute the environment and violate people's rights to a healthy and safe environment and place strict liability on pesticide producers. Create buffer zones around plantations and farms until pesticides are phased out to reduce pesticide exposure risk of children. We, we, these buffer zones, we are thinking, would be very useful around schools, um, especially since children go to, to the schools. And you know, a lot of the schools are now going to open um, next week. Malaysia is opening, and some countries they have already opened, where children are starting to go to school after the pandemic. And so it's really necessary to create buffer zones. Remove existing double standards among countries that are particularly detrimental to countries with weaker uh, regulatory systems. And then we are calling also for something that is really important because there's no um, comprehensive binding treaty to regulate hazardous pesticides. There is the uh, Stockholm Convention that uh, deals with nine to 10 pesticides. Then you have uh, the uh, prior informed consent, which has you know very limited number of pesticides. And even the listing of paraquat, there's been big fights uh, from the producer countries to stop its listing in the Rotterdam Convention, which is basically for information sharing. Uh, and even then the producer countries are refusing to have them listed at least for information sharing uh, from the secretariat, from other countries that have banned this, these uh, pesticides. So we, we really need a comprehensive binding treaty to regulate uh, pesticides throughout their life cycle, taking into account human rights principles and gender rights and children's rights. So um, I will end here by saying thank you very much for this opportunity and uh, um, and yeah, thank you. Well, Saroyeni, thank you so much for this presentation, which is very shocking, very shocking. I mean, the fact that um, you mentioned, I think uh, a million, several million people who are poisoned every year. Can you repeat that figure, please? 385 million uh, farmers and workers um, suffering from acute pesticide poisonings. 385 million, million. million people. Yes. And knowing, of course, as you described, that um, even if you might not die immediately, you might have long-term health effects, as you described, including birth defects, cancer, and others, or blindness, as you showed with the mango 
producers in um, in India. Um, and of course, I think what is maybe most shocking is that the pesticide producers are not taking responsibility and are even continuing to dump forbidden pesticides on countries in Asia, even though they might be a Swiss corporation or a German corporation, they continue to dump these forbidden pesticides, which we're no longer allowed to use in Europe, on these countries. And then they say, oh, the farmers have to, you know, invest and buy the protective gear, but there's, you know, they, they're not taking the responsibility for um, stopping um, these pesticides, including paraquat, which uh, you mentioned. We got a lot of comments and questions, and I think people were particularly upset with the information you shared about the children working in the flower fields being exposed, but also the fact that um, children's food and cookies were being sold in, um, in reused uh, pesticide bags and getting ill from that. So um, yeah, I would like to maybe take some of the questions which we already got in the chats. Um, and I, I'll start at the bottom one, which is also a recommendation you gave, um, asking about banning chemicals around schools. Um, and uh, that is of course a good step, but shouldn't we also be asking to make sure in schools, children eat pesticide free food? Can you yeah. give some comments on that? Yeah, I think that's a wonderful idea. If we can, uh, you know, uh, the idea is because the farmers, uh, you know, in, in Asia uh, who are in the rural areas uh, working around the schools are also uh, facing poverty and, you know, they, they're trying to survive. So the idea is uh, to help them move towards agroecology so that they don't use pesticides and fertilizers and use, uh, you know, low external inputs and uh, basically do their own uh, kind of uh, composting and and it has found it's been found to be possible uh, in many uh, places and I think that will be a good uh, uh, situation and of course if there is a possibility of uh, feeding uh, children um, you know products that are uh, organic or agroecologically product uh, produced I think that will be amazing but a lot of uh, governments don't have the resources or they are not putting this as a major priority for uh, you know, school children being fed uh, lunch. Uh, like Malaysia, we don't have that uh, school, school programs. Um, and so uh, I think that is a very good idea. And I think we should definitely encourage that happen from, uh, you know, continue to happen in more countries. Yeah. I, um, we have an office in Munich and indeed in Munich, um, the city uh, has asked all the kindergartens of the city to only use organic food and, um, and to make sure the cost would still be okay. They have also reduced uh, the amount of meat in the diet and they have gone more to a vegetable plant-based diet so that the costs are the same, but that the food is organic. Uh, and so I think there are really interesting initiatives like this being taken by local authorities um, and which really should be promoted. Um, thank you. Um, I have another question similar to that. It's about, it's from Julieta Schoenman and she asks about if there is a link between pesticides and autism. She says that uh, she has uh, many friends with children who have an um, autistic spectrum. Do you have any information about that? Well, there was a study that was pulled together. It was a comprehensive, you know, kind of compilation of studies. And there was some links to autism, but uh, mainly the organophosphates. Uh, this was done by Pan North America. Um, but I think it's slowly, uh, the, the studies are slowly developing. And, uh, but definitely there is some links. Uh, we're seeing organophosphates uh, as a, partic a particularly, uh, and or organochlorines as possible, um, you know, uh, links to uh, potentially cause uh, the these kinds of, you know, uh, development uh, issues with, uh, with children. Yeah, I have also heard Sarayeni, and correct me if I'm wrong, that um, in pesticides you can also find um, endocrine disruptors and that yes. there should be a link between the endocrine disruptors and autism. 
development. Yes. Yeah? Yeah. 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 So I think, Julieta, there, could, there, there is indeed uh, um, more and more research which shows that um, autism can be related to environmental factors such as um, exposure to chemicals, including pesticides. Yeah. Um, and we'll be happy to share more information about that. Um, and of course, knowing, Juliet, that, that uh, it means you have to protect um, also the parents. Yeah? The parents also need to um, start maybe really reducing the exposure to chemicals and pesticides if they can during uh, the period that they want to um, become parents. I have another question for Saro, um, which is uh, from Max. And his question is, if the world would stop using these highly hazardous pesticides tomorrow, what would happen? Would, would it be a problem? Or would it just yeah. be the corporation? Yes. I think um, um, it will take time uh, because there is a cycle, uh, you know, where uh, farms have been using pesticides and then there needs to be a time for phase out and to uh, move towards agroecology. So it will be a possibility in the future to actually, there's no necessary, actually no necessity to use pesticides in food and uh, uh, fiber production. Um, and therefore, uh, I think that if it happens, there will be good news for all of us, both in terms of uh, the environment and human health. Um, I don't think it will help happen because there's too much of invest in uh, in terms of vested interest. You know, when countries like Thailand were trying to ban four pesticides: chlorpyrifos, paraquat, glyphosate, um, and one more uh, that doesn't come to my mind. There was such a hue and cry to stop the ban from going ahead. Just these four pesticides, which the Thai government decided is a major concern for public health, and they wanted to ban it. And there was a, a you know kind of a protest from the uh, industry, pesticide industry, the U.S. Uh, and uh, all the producers of uh, these chemicals. So um, it's it's a big challenge for us. And uh, I wish it could happen tomorrow, but I don't think it's it's going to be a major problem. People are always creative, inventive, and especially farmers who have this um, knowledge and wisdom that is slowly being eroded, can go back to the land, can go back to uh, producing food and fiber without pesticides and fertilizers, as they've been doing you know, um, for many, many decades now uh, before the Green Revolution. I don't think that, for me, I don't think that is a big problem. Um, and that there is a lot of overproduction. Uh, and so, um, and it's a question of distribution that we have in terms of uh, food uh, consumption. So I think uh, for me, it's it's really a great if it happens, but, uh, but you know, the reality is that we need to have a big uh, struggle uh, to remove some of the highly hazardous pesticides and therefore we need stronger regulations, international collaboration, working together with farmers and scientists to come out with good solutions that are more people uh, uh, friendly or pro people and environmentally you know, uh, sustainable. And, and, uh, and, and I think that's, that's going to make a, a good future for all of us, especially our children. Thank you, Saro. Um, and I know Javier is also waiting, but I have so many questions for you. Um, so if you don't mind, Javier, I'll take a few more for Saro and then we move on. Um, Saro, a Seeds of Green is asking um, if buying food from Asia, for example, uh, if it's not a risk for you know, our own health, because there might be all these highly hazardous pesticides in that food, um, is uh, you know, what is your take on that? And, and, and are there ways we can help farmers in Asia, um, but without putting our own health at risk? Yeah, I, I think the, the, the message for our governments is that if the EU or some of the uh, developed countries or, you know, other countries uh, basically reject pesticide residues in 
in food, it is a good message to our governments in Asia to say, oh, we need to reduce, we need to go, you know, we, we need to look at other ways of production. Um, that's a message to them. Uh, we know that uh, Singapore uh, rejected our uh, vegetables and unfortunately it went back to the domestic market, but it was a message to the producers uh, selling, uh, sending it to, to uh, Singapore to stop uh, using some of the highly hazardous uh, persistent uh, pesticides. And therefore, you know, um, and, and so they tried. And so now there is a better monitoring system in, in those areas where uh, the vegetables are being produced. And therefore, I think that pesticide residues in food is a good message uh, in the sense that it has to be stopped at the border. And, uh, and that's a message that, you know, our governments will be uh, open to, uh, the, the, you know, if you talk about human health, human health, you know, um, it's, a, it's, a, it's, I mean, it's a concern, but for them, when it's economic uh, impacts, they will, you know, stand up and, and listen and see how they can do things uh, to reduce that, uh, those pesticides uh, residues in food. But you also have organically certified farmers in Asia. Farmers. Yes, yes. So we, we, we could support them by specific. Yes. Yeah, could we? Yes, I think we. It will be very good. Uh, only thing I think would be nice to have uh, reduced uh, organic certification fees. <laughs> We're finding it difficult. A lot of farmers complain. Oh, we want to sell. Uh, you know, we want to have uh, organic certification, but it's very expensive. So I think we are we uh, in in Panip are also looking at uh, PGS uh, participatory guarantee system, but that only works in domestic uh, context. If you're exporting it, we still need to do organic certification. Yes, I would say please, please support organic production from Asia, but at the same time, I think look at for uh, look at ways in which. Um, other methods of certification can take place that's not so expensive. Uh, it could be cooperatives or it could be ways of doing this without major, uh, you know, kind of uh, burdens, burden for the farmers. Um, more and more questions coming in. Um, but let me take the very first one we received, uh, a question from the anonymous attendee who asks, um, can't we use novel technologies such as um, genetically modified crops uh, to reduce pesticide use? Yeah, I think uh, for me, GMOs are a major concern because if, and I think Javier may, may be talking a bit about that because a lot of the GMOs were herbicide tolerant uh, uh, crops and uh, basically allowing huge amounts of herbicides particularly glyphosate to be used in these uh, uh, soya crops and you know other crops and uh, and that has tremendous impact on the environment so while they have this uh, promo about reducing uh, pesticides but we are seeing that actually with gmos it's not really helping uh, even the uh, bt corn and bt um, you know uh, uh, GMOs uh, crops uh, are not really helpful because after a while they build insecticide, uh, sorry, uh, resistance. And, uh, and so that has been a, a major issue. Um, and again, they use pesticides. So it becomes uh, not really a good solution uh, in terms of GMOs. Then now they are talking about digitalization of food and agriculture. And, and we are still developing uh, you know, talking to farmers about these possibilities and so uh, studying the impacts. But already we know that with digi digitalization, um, it's going to really be uh, too much of control by the, uh, you know, the same corporations that produce pesticides. And now they are combining uh, with the, um, uh, the, the digital platforms uh, and the data, uh, what do you call those uh, companies, no? Um, and so I, 
uh, we're still studying it, but I have major concerns that this is not the solution for small food producers. It could be more expensive. It could be uh, impactful in terms of, um, you know, basically uh, using more of the inputs like pesticides and fertilizers. Uh, although they say it's going to be more precise, precision uh, agriculture. So um, we, we are a bit more tech, kind of more um, critical of these kinds of uh, uh, technologies that don't really benefit small farmers. Uh, and it, it's just profiting the, the big corporation. So um, just to uh, understand you know, where this is going and what's happening. So we, we will be looking at it more closely uh, in the countries in Asia and the impact on farmers. Thank you so much, Sarah. I have more questions for you, but you can see them yourself in the question and answers. There's one from a funder, what to focus on funding activities, one about um, better laws to prohibit imports of forbidden pesticides, and one about the link to uh, nitrogen and um, making crops more susceptible to um, pests. So have a look at them, and maybe you can answer them also in the chat. Uh, I'll try to come back to you, Saro, after Javier's presentation. Um, but we are already mm, moving ahead fast in our short time slot. So therefore, I would like to thank you very much, Saro, for your presentation. I'll try to come back to you after Javier. And now I would like to uh, ask Javier Souza um, from Pesticide Network um, Latin America to tell us about the situation in Latin America. Um, Javier will also be using a PowerPoint. He will be speaking in Spanish. Unfortunately, um, we can't have simultaneous translation. So we, he will be very kindly translated by Lucia um, uh, back to back. And uh, we'll take also questions and answers for Javier after his presentation. So Javier, the floor is yours. Javier, para ti. Buenos días a todos y a todas, espero que estén bien. Y bueno, disculpas por no poder hablar fluidamente en inglés. Mm -hmm. So Javier saying hello to everyone and uh, apologies for not being able to speak English, which I don't think any of us will blame him for. Um, voy a complementar algunas de las cosas que seguramente ya expresó Saro respecto a los plaguicidas. Ahí, bueno, una imagen de lo que es mi país, Argentina con los cultivos, fundamentalmente mmm, refleja lo que pasa en Argentina, en el resto de Latinoamérica, con los cultivos de soja, maíz, uh, hortalizas, frutas y tabaco. So here we have a map of Javier's country, Argentina, um, reflecting the different crops that are cultivated in Argentina um, and um, the amount that is produced every year. Eh, justamente la, la crisis derivada del coronavirus eh, nos ha puesto en alerta y yo considero fundamental tener en cuenta con ustedes que ha cuestionado fundamentalmente nuestra relación con los bienes naturales, con el agua, con el suelo, con el aire. Eh, sí. La crisis derivada del coronavirus también ha interpelado mucho nuestras relaciones sociales y nuestra alimentación. So the corona coronavirus crisis has really um, put the, the country on high alert in terms of its relationships with natural resources and also um, with the social and, um, and cultural relationships as well. Pero también has cuestionado dos cuestiones fundamentales. Una, los modos de producción de nuestros alimentos y fundamentalmente el antropocentrismo, esta mirada de que el ser humano está por encima de todos los seres vivos en la naturaleza. But perhaps the most fundamental question that the crisis has brought to light is our relationship with um, how we produce food and the anthropocentric, anthropocentric um, aspect of our food production, which um, puts humans above any other beings um, on the planet. Es interesante pensar también que el incremento en el uso de plaguicidas en Latinoamérica y en el mundo se relaciona con, con otros procesos muy fuertes. 
la so deforestación. <laughs> Continúa. <laughs> um, sí. And so it's interesting to think about the use of pesticides within these relationships um, in our food production systems. La, eh, la deforestación, el avance de la frontera agropecuaria, el avance fundamentalmente de los monocultivos, y ahí tenemos que hacer mucho hincapié. Saro ya lo dijo, la gran pérdida de diversidad biológica derivada de los modos de hacer agricultura que refuerza permanentemente la utilización de plaguicidas. Um, and so here as well we have to think about um, other issues such as deforestation um, and the biodiversity crisis um, and climate change, which all um, are kind of related to the use of pesticides in industrial agriculture. Por último, me gustaría también enfrentar el tema del cambio climático, el gran uso de fertilizantes, de plaguicidas, la deforestación, son causas del cambio, del cambio climático, de la emisión de gases de efecto invernadero, y justamente en muchos casos esto vuelve más vulnerable a la agricultura y dependiente de plaguicidas. And so all of these aspects, um, such as the use of pesticides and um, deforestation and the rise of monocultures is just really making our food systems more vulnerable um, to the climate crisis. También para compartir con ustedes, cuando intentamos definir qué es un plaguicida, tenemos muchas disputas en torno al concepto, en torno al nombre. Esto está pasando en muchos países de Latinoamérica, donde muchas veces se quiere alejar la peligrosidad de los plaguicidas denominándolos de otra manera. Es interesante plantear esto, muchos nombres, plaguicidas, remedios, venenos. La industria muchas veces los llama fitosanitarios, tratando de alejar uh, el problema de la salud de estos productos. So here it's really um, an issue of language, but what Javier is saying is that in South America, the term pesticide um, is used in lots of different, or there's lots of different terms used to, to talk about pesticides, um, and they kind of make the term quite vague um, and unclear, um, separating them in a way from all of the um, health and environmental damages that they cause. Tenemos muchos plaguicidas, ya lo dijo Saro, herbicidas, insecticidas, fungicidas, rodenticidas. Es muy importante considerar fundamentalmente el principio activo, que es uh, aquella sustancia que, que teóricamente es la que hace blanco uh, en el organismo para el cual uh, está creado el plaguicida, pero no podemos olvidar que muchos plaguicidas, además de sus principios activos, tienen otros elementos que se le agregan y que también los vuelven notablemente peligrosos. Um, and so here, um, speaking about the term of pesticides as well, even though their principal um, agent might be to reduce the, the growth of weeds, um, it's important to remember that they have a whole range of very dangerous active ingredients as well. Para que podamos ver juntos la gran problemática de los plaguicidas es que cuando un producto químico sale al ambiente, cuando un producto químico es arrojado en el ambiente, perdemos toda posibilidad de controlar su efecto. Y ahí vemos cómo pueden contaminar el agua, contaminar los suelos, persistir durante mucho tiempo e incluso eh, alcanzar zonas por el viento muy alejadas de donde fueron aplicados. And so here this image really shows that once we've used those pesticides, um, we lose control of just how far they, they spread um, and how they affect entire ecosystems. Algunas cuestiones también para charlar una pregunta a Saro respecto a los cultivos transgénicos. Uh, en todo el cono sur de América Latina hay una fuerte asociación de los cultivos transgénicos y el uso de plaguicidas. 
Um, and so here, another related topic in, in um, South America is the use of genetically modified crops and um, how they often go hand in hand with the use of pesticides. Hace 25 años los cultivos transgénicos se presentaron como que iban a acabar con el hambre del mundo, iban a incrementar los rendimientos, iban a reducir uh, el uso de plaguicidas y, y, y a 25 años vemos que esto no ocurrió. So 25 years ago, genetically modified crops were presented as a solution to global hunger and an array of um, other um challenges of food systems at the time but today we see that um rather than reducing the use of pesticides if anything they've increased the use of pesticides in agriculture hoy en la realidad vemos que por lo, por lo menos en argentina hay 24 millones de hectáreas de cultivos transgénicos se utilizan 510 millones de litros de plaguicidas voy a repetir despacio 510 millones de litros de plaguicidas y según un análisis que hicimos eh, de los 445 principios activos de plaguicidas que se usan en Argentina, casi el 30% pueden considerarse como altamente peligrosos. And so here are some stats for um, Argentinian agriculture. Um, so 24 millions of, of hectares are um, genetically modified crops and 510 millions of liters of pesticides um, are used on the food systems and out of these 30% are considered highly dangerous. Por último, y ahora avanzamos más en el tema de plaguicidas, siempre aparece la dicotomía entre usamos plaguicidas o va a haber hambre en el mundo. Y es interesante pensar en esto. Hoy en Argentina tenemos 25 millones de hectáreas de cultivos transgénicos, se aplican 510 millones de litros de plaguicidas y tenemos igual el 40% de la población por debajo de la línea de pobreza. And so here Javier is really thinking about um, the common dichotomy that is used in um, mainstream agriculture, which is that either we use pesticides or there will be um, global hunger. But what is interesting to think about is at the moment, we are using a lot of pesticides and that doesn't seem to be solving any issues of hunger or malnutrition. Ahí vemos el mercado de agroquímicos en Argentina. Es muy difícil conseguir los datos. Las empresas no están presentando los datos. Estas son estimaciones que hemos hecho, pero ustedes pueden fijarse cómo desde el año 2013 hasta el año 2019 se fue incrementando notablemente el uso de plaguicidas. Esta tiene que ver fundamentalmente con el gran desarrollo de los monocultivos, la gran pérdida de diversidad biológica y que justamente el uso de plaguicidas refuerza ¿no? la utilización de plaguicidas porque las hierbas los insectos se hacen cada vez más resistentes. Um, and so here we've got some stats which are quite difficult to get hold of, um, of the amount of pesticides in, um, in millions of liters uh, that are used on agriculture. And so we can see that since 2013, they've been constantly rising, which just so shows that it's a vicious cycle of um, increased pesticide um, use Um, because of its um, detrimental impact on um, soil health and biodiversity. Ahí vemos algunos datos, entonces se usan 500 millones de litros de plaguicidas en Argentina, eh, el 30% pueden ser considerados como altamente peligrosos, ahora voy a referirme a ese término. Otra cuestión interesante para pensar, eh, hay eh, 140 plaguicidas que en Argentina se usan y que están prohibidos en algunos lugares del mundo. Estos son dos datos, interés, tres datos interesantes para pensar. La cantidad de plaguicidas que se usan, 500 millones de litros al año, y el tipo de plaguicidas, la gran mayoría altamente peligrosos, 
y muchos de ellos, 140, prohibidos en algunos lugares del mundo. So here we have some more um, stats. Um, so in Argentina, 500 millions of, um, of liters of pesticides are used every year. Um, and of these, 140 are actually prohibited in other parts of the country, uh, other parts of the world, sorry. También un dato interesante, lo puse ahí al final, que Argentina está batiendo el récord de uso de fertilizantes sintéticos. Y esto también tiene que ver con los plaguicidas, porque al usar muchos fertilizantes, eh, las plantas no crecen de manera adecuada y se hacen cada vez más dependientes porque se hacen vulnerables a los insectos y a los hongos. Um, and here just to note that there's also been a, been a, a, a stark rise in the use of artificial fertilizers since 2019. Um, and Javier is just pointing out that the, the use of pesticides inevitably results in an increased use um, of artificial fertilizers as well. Yo les comentaba recién, los plaguicidas altamente peligrosos, es una categoría que fue recreada por la OMS y la FAO, donde también PAN Internacional hemos puesto algunas variables para tener en cuenta. Les quiero contar qué características tienen estos plaguicidas. Fíjense, uh, de esos 130 productos que yo les decía que se usaban en Argentina, considerados como altamente peligrosos, muchos tienen una fuerte toxicidad aguda. So here are just some more, um, here's just some more information about um, the, the pesticides that are in use in Argentina. Um, so we've already mentioned that 30% are highly um, dangerous. And of, Fíjense. sorry, of, um, of these as well, 13. Um, un 20%, un 20 de esos plaguicidas altamente peligrosos pueden ser mortales al ser inhalados, con solo olerlos, tenemos 32 plaguicidas que pueden ser causantes de cáncer, 25 plaguicidas que pueden ser considerados como perturbadores endocrinos y 15 um, plaguicidas so, tóxicos a la reproducción. Ok. So, um, of these 30%, 20% can be um, deadly um, and 26% are links to... Um, cancer cases. 32, eh, 25 como perturbadores endocrinos y, y 15 tóxicos para la reproducción. And 15% are um, toxic to the reproductive system. Pero también fíjense, muchos de esos poseen una toxicidad elevada para las abejas. Um, uh, and, and they're also very dangerous for bees. Algunos de esos plaguicidas son mutagénicos. Um, y esto tiene relación con la, una de las preguntas que le hicieron a Saro. Justamente, muchos plaguicidas que son mutagénicos se utilizan en las hortalizas y quedan como residuos en esas hortalizas y después son ingeridos por los seres humanos. Um, so, I'm not entirely sure on the, on the terms used here. So, maybe Sasha, you can help. But I think uh, what Javier said is that. Um, a lot of these leads to lead to mutations, genetic mutations. Y también sabemos entonces que, que estos plaguicidas pueden afectar a otros seres vivos, ¿no? Por ejemplo, acumularse en las cadenas tróficas y afectar a las aves y a los mamíferos. Hay plaguicidas que son muy tóxicos en los organismos acuáticos. O sea, pensar que estos plaguicidas no solamente afectan a los seres humanos, sino al resto de los seres vivos, seguramente de los cuales dependemos para nuestra propia vida. Um, and here it's just to note that um, these pesticides aren't just dangerous to human health, but they affect all areas of our ecosystem that we depend on for our own survival as well. Por ejemplo, ahí bueno, vemos algunos de los plaguicidas altamente usados, el paracuate, el glifosato, atracina, Um, and these are just um, some of the mainly, um, the highly used pesticides in Argentina. So we've got um, paraquat, glyphosate, um, atrocina, I don't know how to say that in English. 
Ah, tracina, bien, bien, Lucía. <risa> Caben eh, muchos insecticidas, ¿no? El imidacopil, el fipronil, que están prohibidos, por ejemplo, en la Unión Europea. And here there's also um, a list of insecticides used in Argentina, many of which are banned in the EU. Y ahí vemos las alteraciones, ¿no? Uh, en la salud a partir de muchas investigaciones que se han hecho en Argentina y en Latinoamérica. Uh, las alteraciones endócrinas, el daño genético, las alteraciones en el sistema nervioso. And so that's just a reminder of all the impacts on human health that these um, herbicides, insecticides and fungicides have. Es interesante también hacer una mención tomando, tomando en cuenta lo que tiene que ver con esta presentación y el, el interés de ustedes en conocer en que que en muchos casos los plaguicidas uh, que causan un fuerte efecto en la salud de las personas uh, conviven prácticamente toda la vida, ¿no? Desde, desde que una persona es niño y trabaja con los padres, uh, en muchos casos los plaguicidas se almacenan dentro de las casas de las personas, con lo cual, bueno, esto va recreando muchas veces uh, un, una cierta convivencia entre los plaguicidas y las familias productoras, que es algo que tenemos que trabajar y trabajar mucho para que, en todo, para que entre todos podamos reconocer la peligrosidad que tienen eh, dentro de nuestra salud. Um, and so here we're just talking about um, the kind of the impact that these pesticides have on um, agricultural labors, laborers' lives um, and how really they they influence all aspects of their of their um, health and daily lives. También es interesante pensar que los plaguicidas y esto es un estudio que hicimos aquí en en el cono sur de América Latina no solamente uh, tienen una problemática en las actividades agrarias. Los plaguicidas se usan mucho en los domicilios, por ejemplo, para el control de parásitos en mascotas, en perros y en gatos. So this is a really interesting study that was done in South America, which looked at the use of pesticides, not only in agriculture, but in domestic use as well. For example, um, at home with um, pets. El control de insectos en las casas, uh, hormigas, uh, uh, se usa mucho para preservantes en las maderas, en las campañas sanitarias, por ejemplo, de, de, contra el dengue. And even in terms of... Um, protection against domestic pests um, and treatment of wooden furniture um, or uh, even in certain health cases, for example, in protection against the dengue virus. Bueno, los niños seguramente son aquellos que, que más están expuestos a los plaguicidas y quienes deben preocuparnos más, uh, sea porque, porque reciben ya la problemática de sus padres, porque muchos plaguicidas viajan por vía uh, de la placenta o, o porque uh, uh, los absorben a partir de, de la leche materna. Y además, fundamentalmente, porque los niños acompañan a sus padres muchas veces en sus tareas de, domésticas y laborales. And so, um, children are, are probably the, the, the ones that are most vulnerable to the use of these pesticides. Um, because they carry the genetic, um, the genetic history of their parents, and even through um, the um, the breastfeeding um, and kind of carrying the weight of all of the um, the parents' um, history and also daily routines. Bueno, vemos algunos de los efectos de los plaguicidas que son disruptores endocrinos. Pueden afectar los cientos de producción de hormonas, pueden afectar uh, los centros de recepción de las hormonas e incluso pueden transformarse en hormonas. Um, and so here's just a kind of image of all of the um, anatomical disruption um, of pesticides. Yeah, and also specifically uh, hormone disrupting pesticides or endocrine disrupting uh, pesticides, so which change the hormone system in our bodies. 
um, which are linked, which are also found in pesticides. Yeah. Hay muchas investigaciones que nos están hablando también de las enfermedades epigenéticas, o sea, son enfermedades en las cuales se eh, altera la expresión del ADN, pero no su estructura. And so there's also a lot of studies on the um, epigenetic um, impacts of pesticides, um, and so where the structure, the structure of our DNA is mo modified. También hay muchos plaguicidas neurotóxicos eh, que, que uh, afectan las funciones motoras, la, la visión, la coordinación, uh, afectan fundamentalmente a los niños eh, cuando están expuestos a los plaguicidas. Um, and so also there's a lot of neurotoxic um, threats of pesticides. So for example, impacting our vision or our coordination, Um, and this can be particularly dangerous for children. I see a photo of a niño applicando plaguicidas. Here's just a picture of a child um, applying pesticides. Por último, en los dos o tres minutos que me quedan, plantear que, que, que podemos pensar que no estamos condenados a, la, a los plaguicidas. La agroecología, lo mismo que nos estuvo contando Jaro, eh, Saro, es un paradigma es un cambio fundamental, no solamente en nuestros modos de producir alimentos, sino de relacionarnos con la naturaleza. Y así dos fotos, donde se puede hacer agroecología a nivel urbano, a nivel doméstico, y también a nivel de las producciones agrarias. And so, similar to what Saru um, was explaining before, agroecology presents itself as a paradigm that not only... Um, liberates us from the use of pesticides, but rethinks our whole relationship um, with the natural world and with the ecosystems around us. La agroecología es un paradigma en el cual no solamente perseguimos producir alimentos, sino relacionarnos de mejor manera entre los seres humanos y con el resto de los seres vivos, recuperar armonías y fundamentalmente salir del antropocentrismo. So, um, Agroecology is a paradigm that not only allows us to rethink uh, our food systems, but our whole relationship as humans um, with other beings on the planet and regain a sense of um, balance with these other beings and um, move away from the um, anthropo anthropo anthropocentric um, la, la agroecology. La agroecología promueve fundamentalmente la diversidad biológica y la nutrición adecuada de los suelos. Um, agroecology promotes um, above all um, health, soil health. La, la agroecología posee una fuerte dimensión espiritual. No es solamente cambiar de sistemas de producción, sino respetar toda forma de vida, recuperar nuestra noción de trascendencia y fundamentalmente una relación armónica con todos los seres vivos. Y hay algunas fotos, ¿no? Recuperando semillas, tratando de alimentar bien a los suelos. So there's also a, a, an important spiritual dimension to agroecology, which is about regaining that sense of harmony for all forms of life um, and, and a kind of um, rethinking the notion of um, trans transcendence um, as well. Y también como hubo una de las preguntas, la agroecología promueve justamente recrear sistemas productivos que nos permitan tener la producción de alimentos sanos. La idea es tener suelos sanos, alimentos sanos para personas sanas. So ultimately the idea is to promote healthy soils for healthy food systems and um, And healthy societies. También lo interesante de la agroecología integramos saberes, saberes científicos, pero también saberes comunitarios. And another interesting aspect of agroecology is um, how we integrate different notions of knowledge, so scientific knowledge, but also community knowledge and farmer knowledge. Vinculamos la agroecología con el cambio climático, no solamente para producir menor el efecto gases de efecto invernadero, sino también para 
adaptarnos a los cambios que se están dando. It can also present um, an important solution to climate change um, and provide us with more adaptability um, facing these changes. También se relaciona con la economía social, la idea de buscar, y bueno, y apareció una de las preguntas, ¿no? Hoy respecto a la certificación agroecológica, buscamos que desde la agroecología se produzcan alimentos sanos para todas las personas dentro del comercio justo, la economía social, los mercados de cercanía. And it's also, it's also important um, from an economic and a social aspect because um, it can provide um, fairer systems uh, for everyone. Estoy terminando. Buscar relaciones uh, armónicas entre todos los seres vivos, buscar relaciones armónicas al interior de los seres humanos. And just really to summarize now, because we're finishing up, but um, it promotes uh, a harmonious relationship between humans with our relationship with the earth and in our own bodies as well. Y por último, yo quiero reconocer que, que desde la agroecología se ha fomentado y se ha visibilizado la participación de las mujeres en las actividades agropecuarias. El trabajo de la mujer se ha visibilizado, ampliado, profundizado y reconocido. And so this is also just to recognize as well how um, agroecology has really um, made visible the role of women in farming and kind of acknowledged um, the, the impact and, and the, um, yeah, their role. Y por último, hay muchas oportunidades para el desarrollo de la agroecología en nuestros países de América Latina. Hay cada vez más productores y productoras agroecológicos. And so finally, there's um, a real rise in these movements in South America at the moment um, and in agroecological um, production. Pero también tenemos muchas amenazas, las políticas públicas de nuestros países que buscan fomentar la, la exportación, las alianzas de muchos de nuestros gobiernos con las empresas productoras de plaguicidas y la necesidad de generar ingresos que muchas veces llevan a que se incremente la utilización de estos plaguicidas. Um, but there's also um, a lot of external threats to the use, um, to the rise of agroecological agro movements um, from kind of a political perspective, but also business and trade as well. Muchísimas gracias. Y ahí está la página de Rapal y mi mail si ustedes tienen ganas de hacer alguna consulta. So Muchas gracias, Lucía, much. por tu traducción. <laughs> <laughs> de nada, Javier. So thank you very much, everyone. Here we've got the um, Rapal website and um, Javier's email address as well. Thank you very much, Javier. And thank you very much, Lucia, for the excellent translation with very difficult technical term. You did fabulously. Um, and uh, Javier, thank you for your presentation because I think what we saw is that in Latin America, the situation is similar to Asia, but maybe more extreme. Um, as you showed us your statistics from, for example, Argentina, where you have indeed shown us that there is, has been a very great expanse of mono, monoculture production uh, of crops, but also of other um, biomass and a very large increase of um, pesticides, including also highly hazardous pesticides and pesticides which have been banned in other countries. Uh, and it, especially that it hasn't had the desired um, impact on food security and on poverty reduction in your country, but that it's very much um, uh, benefiting of, you know, larger uh, corporations and, and exportations. Um, so I think it uh, also gave us a different perspective, uh, maybe because the situation is already more extreme in your country and there is this direct link with climate change. Uh, in your region, 
um, the expansion of the monocultures like soy, soy production has really led to deforestation, has really contributed very strongly to deforestation and therefore is one of the drivers of climate change. So the agricultural system in your country is one of the is one of the killers of climate change. And I think it goes hand in hand with the increase of the pesticide use and the increase of the use of genetically um, yeah, manipulated crops. So um, I think therefore even more uh, worrying uh, to see what, what you have told us today. Um, but also happy to see that there are a lot of um, developments in the direction of agroecology, especially at the community level and using indigenous people's knowledge. So thank you for this presentation. I have um, questions um, from the participants and please continue to ask questions to Javier and also again to Saro. Saro has already been answering some of the questions in the Q&A so everybody can also see them. But for you Javier, um, I have a question and Lucia can translate or I can maybe translate it. Um, in the beginning, you say that you saw an increase of pesticides, mm -hmm. which has gone hand in hand with an increase of fertilizers. Um, and the question is, why is that the case? Um, no sé si um, lo puedo traducir, si no Lucia puede ayudar. Um, al principio has dicho, Javier, que has visto en tu región una augmentación de utilizo de pesticidas, plaguicidas y también de fertilizantes. Um, y queríamos saber por qué esta, esta combinación. Gracias. Bueno, eh, sí. Bueno, el, el, el gran desarrollo de los, de los monocultivos en, en todo el cono sur y en gran parte de América Latina va siendo un doble efecto, ¿no? Por un lado, una pérdida de diversidad biológica y por otro lado, se va perdiendo justamente la uh, capacidad biológica, uh, química y física de los suelos, ¿no? Son, son dos fenómenos que se dan juntos. El gran desarrollo de los monocultivos lleva a que los suelos perdan fertilidad y por eso el gran uso de fertilizantes y que lleva también a que haya una gran pérdida de diversidad y por uso el uso de plaguicidas. A su vez, eso, eso el lo... uso de Sí, sí, sí. <laughs> Lucía, could you try and translate this first part? <laughs> okay, I, I'm, I'm worried that I might have missed some of that, but I think what Javier was saying that in general, if you look at the bigger picture, the rise of monoculture leads to the, um, the loss of soil health and the loss of soil biodiversity, which in turn leads to a increased need of artificial fertilizers. So it's a bit of a vicious cycle. Yeah, indeed. So there's a una, una additional question that would take a lot of time to analyze today, but Los fertilizantes no alimentan a las plantas, con lo cual también eso genera que las plantas estén desequilibradas y sean más atacadas por los insectos, por ejemplo. ¿Sí? And so here's a question un gran desarrollo to... que habla de la nutrición de las plantas de manera adecuada. Um, and so here's a question that we might not have time to address today, but the, the issue is that fertile, artificial fertilizers don't actually um, nourish or replenish plants. Um, in fact, they make them more vulnerable to, um, to pests. Um, so so the, the term fertilizer is, is maybe misleading. That's really interesting, Javier. And also, I think it's important to note for those who don't know that fertilizers are a mineral which is limited. It's like a fossil mineral, which is mined only in a few places. Um, but that you have much better fertilizer, uh, which is organic fertilizer. So maybe Javier, you can say a little bit, what is the alternatives to synthetic fertilizer? Because everybody talks about fertilizer, but then we talk about the synthetic mineral mined fertilizer, but you have good food for plants. What is good food for plants? 
Javier, ¿qué es la alternativa a los fertilizantes sintéticos que, son, que dan suficiente? Um... Bueno, ahí estamos trabajando y mucho. Yo mostré algunas de las fotos donde estamos trabajando justamente intentando recuperar fertilidad de los suelos a partir de uso de abonos verdes, de inclusión de árboles, de abonos compuestos. Todo depende del de, de, de sistema productivo, depende mucho también de la actividad económica, pero hay muchas alternativas para nutrir mejor a los suelos. Depende mucho. Abonos verdes, inclusión de árboles, abonos compuestos, rotaciones de cultivos. Ok, so I, I, I think you might have to help me here, Sasha, with the terms, but I think what Javier was saying, that there's a lot of different alternatives, um, including green manure, uh, increasing tree cover on farms, um, uh, mixed composting as well. Did I miss any? <laughs> yeah, more crop rotations and yeah, excellent. Thank you, Lucia. Okay, thank you, Javier. I have uh, another question, uh, which I think is linked from Max Fraser. Um, you can also see it in the question uh, box. Um, in arable systems, organic producers tend to plow to create their seed bed, which releases stored carbon and disrupts fungal networks. Non-organic producers can go for a non-till approach, but tend to use glyphosate to create a clean seed bed, but less carbon released, even though the fungi are probably wiped out with the chemicals. Is there a third and better approach? So I think the third and better approach is maybe what you were just talking about. Entonces, um, Javier, um, Max pregunta um, en producción orgánico, um, se um, tila la tierra para poner las semillas, uh, pero este puede disruptar el uh, red fungal. Los producientes no orgánicos Um, pueden hacer um, sin este tila utilizando glifosato para hacer un, 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 un plano uh, para sus semillas uh, y probablemente los fungis están muertas. Pero, ¿qué es la tercera opción para que podría ser mejor? Y supongo que es similar a lo que has dicho ahora mismo. Hay una sí, tercera manera. Que... La, la agroecología es, es, es mucho más que la agricultura orgánica. Eh, la agroecología buscamos no solamente producir alimentos sin usar plaguicidas, sino cambiar la mirada que tenemos de la relación con, los, con, con todos los seres vivos. Eh, okay, eh, uh, uh, sí, perdón, Lucía. Perdón, perdón Lucía. Uh, sí, vamos sí. poco a poco. Um, sí. So, aquí Javier dice que Agroecology is much more than just organic agriculture or farming without pesticides. It, it's about rethinking our whole um, relationship with our food systems and with um, our wider ecosystems. For example, in this de, 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 de elaborar, de, 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 de trabajar menos los suelos, justamente para, para respetar toda la vida que hay en los suelos, de abonar de generar diversidad biológica. La agroecología no tiene recetas, pero fundamentalmente trabajamos según el lugar, el clima, el tipo social de productor. O sea, hay, hay muchas variables para tener en cuenta cuando estamos pensando en la agroecología. Insisto, es mucho más allá de no usar plaguicidas. And so also, um, Javier saying there's not one recipe for agroecology. It depends very much on where we are and um, the people's knowledge of, of, that, of that area and the culture. Um, and that there's, yeah, there's multiple ways of approaching it. So, Javier, thank you so much. I have many more questions for you, but I'm afraid we are very close to the <laughs> limit of our session. Um, So uh, Francesca is checking if we have a little bit more time because we had to do the extra translation. So we had less time in total. But um, I want to make sure that everybody who participates uh, knows that we will be, of course, sharing the links 
Um, we will try to still get you some answers. Also, Rod Everett, who also just put a question, uh, uh, even though we will have to close the session. Um, we uh, are very uh, happy for the very participate, participative and active uh, discussion. Uh, and we're happy that these topics will also be taken later today and tomorrow. You can always get in contact with Javier and Saro. Yeah, they have given uh, their email addresses. Maybe Saro and Javier, you can uh, put them in the chat box once more for people to copy. Um, and this is, of course, an amazing uh, topic. Yeah, it's the big challenge of our times. It's directly linked with fighting climate change, and it's directly linked with fighting diseases such as cancer and autism. Um, and uh, we know where to go, but we are facing indeed um, something which looks like uh, uh, yeah, the very large corporations, lots of investments, a little bit like bad banks, you know, you have to, <laughs> you have to find a way out for these large corporations. And, um, and our role in Europe is also really to work with the legislation we have and with our own companies who are based here and get them to um, change their, um, their, their strategies and to take responsibility for the immense damage which is being done to people and the planet. And I'm afraid we have to go. It's a great time uh, to wrap up, says Francesca. So we want to thank Francesca, Anna and Lucia and the entire ORFC team for giving us this space for discussion. And uh, we wish you a very good continuation. Thank you very much. Thank you. And see you hopefully at the next session or next year. All thank right. you, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Bye bye. Muchas gracias. Que estén muy bien todos. Gracias. Gracias, Lucía. Gracias, Sasha. Que estén muy bien todos. Salud, Gemi, que estés bien. Sasha, Francesca, Lucía.